Procedural terrain generation can sound like an incredibly scary subject, especially if you're just getting started in coding, but it doesn't have to be that way. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can turn random noise into incredible looking cave systems by following an article on Rogue Basin. Let's jump onto the computer and get started. The article we're looking at today is called Cellular Automata Method for Generating Random Cave-like Levels, which is a mouthful of a title and it sounds really scary, but it's actually a very simple concept. So what a cellular automata is, and we've looked at this before on this channel when we've looked at the game of life, is essentially a system that is based on a grid and we look at the neighboring cells of a grid cell to figure out what that grid cell should turn into. So if you look here in this introduction as a very visual representation, you can see that there are several iterations of this grid-like pattern. And over over time it resolves itself into a cave-like structure. And you can see in this introduction as well, they've also got the rules that we can use to figure out what the cell should become in the next iteration of the system. So it says here, the basic idea is to fill the first map randomly, then repeatedly create new maps using the four to five rule. And that rule is, a tile becomes a wall if it was already a wall and four or more of its eight neighbors were walls, or if it was not a wall and five or more neighbors were. So thankfully they've put this little easier to digest section in here. So basically if we have a three by three grid centered on the cell that we're currently looking at, if there's five wall cells in that three by three area, then in the next generation, the center tile will become a wall. And so essentially, as they say here, what we're doing is over time, each cell will become more like its neighboring cells. So you can see in the original generation here, we've just got a mishmash of tiles that are either walls or not walls. And over time, it sort of congeals, if you like, into these regions of walls and caves. Now that we've got the basic idea of how this works, let's jump into the code and give it a crack. So for the code in this video, I'm gonna be using JavaScript and the P5.js library, which just makes drawing things on the screen incredibly easy. And P5.js has an online editor, so I can just easily share this code with you and you can run it in your browser right away. So if you wanna see that code, it'll be linked in the description. But of course, this code can be adapted to any language or framework that you like, because the concept itself is very exchangeable between languages. So the first thing we're going to do is create a grid of cells that we can randomly fill and display that on the screen. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a, an array called tiles. Then I'm also going to define how big our grid is. So I've got a width of 40 cells and a height of 40 cells. So then what I've got is two for loops that will loop over every single grid in our cell. So I've got a variable i, which corresponds to the x coordinate, and it starts at zero and goes up to the width of our grid, incrementing by one each time. And then I've got the same thing for a j variable, which goes between zero and the height and also increments by one each time. For each square in our grid, I'm going to be randomly choosing whether it's solid or not. So if this value is true, so the random value is less than 0.5, then it will be solid. And if this random value is greater than 0.5, this solid value will be false. So what we're doing is we're essentially filling a tiles array full of either true for a solid wall or false for a floor tile. And now we want to actually display these tiles on the screen. So in p5.js, the setup function just gets called once at the start, and that's where we're filling our tiles array. And then the draw function gets called over and over again. And so this is where we're going to be doing the actual drawing of our tiles, which kind of makes sense given the name of the function we're in. So what we're doing is we're again looping over every single square in the grid, and then we're going to either draw it as black if it's solid or white if it's not solid. We're looping through all of the grid positions and we're finding the value in the tiles array that corresponds to this current X and Y location. And we do this using this formula here. Now I have explained this in some very, very old videos of mine. So I don't expect you to have seen them, but essentially what we're doing is the X position plus the Y position times however many tiles we've got in a row. So if you think about it this way, I think the explanation I gave was just trash. So I'm going to throw a graphic on the screen for you that will hopefully explain it. If you don't understand it, please just ask me in the comments. But essentially, we're just finding out in the tiles array at this given tile location, is it a wall or is it not? And if it is a wall, we're going to be making the fill color black. And otherwise, if it's not a wall, we're going to be making that fill color white. And so now we can just draw a square at the tile location on the screen. Thankfully, by doing things in two for loops like this, we can very easily figure out our X and Y location for the tile we're currently drawing. As you can see here, I've just got I times the cell size and J times the cell size. And then the square that we're drawing has a side length of the cell size. Now the cell size, we haven't actually figured out yet. So right at the top of the draw, we're just going to figure that out. 
And to do that, we can simply divide the width by the number of tiles we've got in our grid. Now, of course, this works out very well for me because the width and height of my grid are the same and the width and height of the canvas that I'm drawing on are the same. So I've got a square and this makes this calculation very easy. If you've got a different aspect ratio, you might have to play around with the cell size or you could just define it at the top of your sketch. So now when we run this, you can see that we get some black and white squares on our screen in a random pattern. And if we run it again, we get a completely new pattern every single time. Now, just for aesthetic reasons, I'm going to turn off the stroke of these squares so they're not going to have an outline and that's just a preference of mine, but you can leave the outlines on if that's your preference. So if we go back to the article, you can see we've just completed this section here where we've got a randomly filled map. So now what we need to do is loop through all of the tiles in our grid and figure out how many neighbors it's got. And then based on that, if it's going to be a wall or not in the next iteration of the grid. So let's get stuck into that. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a function called num walls around and giving it an X and a Y location. And this function is going to return how many wall tiles there are centered around the X and Y location that we've given it. We're starting off by saying the number is zero, and then we're going to loop through this negative one to one range in both the X and the Y direction. And what these are will be offsets from the position we've given it. So we'll go back one in the X and Y and work our way through the three by three grid all the way up to plus one in the X and Y. So the X and Y location we give it will be the center of the three by three area. And instead of trying to mess around with this formula that we had to do before, I'm going to just create a get tile method that will just return the tile value at a given location. As you can see, this is doing exactly what we were doing up here. And in fact, we can now replace this with our new get tile function. We can also use it in the num walls around function. So if the tile we're looking at is a wall, we want to increment the number of walls. So as you can see, I've actually renamed that get tile function to be called is solid because that makes more sense to me because we're returning true if it is solid and false if it's not. And so then this reads a bit more like English as well then. So we're saying if the tile is solid at the X plus I and the Y plus J location, so those are our offsets to make it in the three by three area. If it is solid, then we wanna increase the number of tiles around us that are solid. And then we're returning the number of tiles at the end. So now theoretically, this function will give us how many tiles there are that are walls around a certain point. And so we can now now use this to generate the next generation of our cave system. So I've created a function called iterate tiles. And as you can see, I'm creating a new tiles array. And at the end, we're going to replace the tiles that we currently have with the new tiles. Now we can't update the tiles array itself because this will change the results as we're updating the tiles. So we need the tiles to be a snapshot in time and then create a new version of the tiles so that we don't get any weirdness. You know the drill by now, we're going to be looping through all of the tiles in our grid. For each tile in our grid, we're going to be finding out how many neighbors it has that are walls and we're storing that in a value called num. And then if that number is greater than or equal to five, then that new tile value will be true, which corresponds to it being solid, which means it's a wall. And we push that result into our new tiles array. This iterate tiles function should be creating our cave system for us, but we're not calling it anywhere yet. So for the moment, what we might do when we press the mouse, it will call this iterate tiles function and we should see our cave emerge. I've just created the mouse release function, which gets called when the mouse gets released. And that in turn calls the iterate tiles function. And when we run this, we can see that every time we click the mouse, we're getting some weird stuff going on. It looks like it's rotating each time. Let me just figure out what's going on here. So I figured it out. It's nothing too major, thankfully. Essentially, I just needed to switch which direction we're iterating through first. So we're iterating through J first and then I when we're iterating through the tiles and also when we're creating the tiles in the first place in the setup function. And this is just to do with the way that we're accessing the tile values in the is solid function. So now if we run this again, you can see every time we click the mouse, it slowly congeals into a cave system. And if you click enough, you can see that it reaches a conclusion where it won't change anymore. But you can see there's something funky going on because this cave system is wide open. Because remember, the white tiles are meant to be representing the floor tiles. But as you can see, the edges are pretty much bare. And I think what's going on is when we're at one of these edge tiles, we're looking at a three by three area around it. So it's trying to access values that are outside of our grid, essentially. And I think they must be returning some value that in JavaScript, at least, compiles down to it being true. 
what we want to do is we want to catch these variables and say if we're outside of the perimeter of our grid default it to being a wall and to do this we can do some very simple checks inside our is solid function All we're doing is we're adding in a check in the top of the is solid function that says if the x is outside the bounds of the screen or the y value is outside the bounds of the screen then return true saying that that tile is solid so if we're out of the screen it's a solid tile and now when we run this and we iterate through the tiles you can see that the edge tiles are much more likely to be walls now and that's because they're counting the ones outside of the screen to be wall tiles so that's pretty much it for this algorithm it's not as complicated as it might seem on the surface one thing i am going to quickly fix up is this starting percentage that dictates whether it's a solid tile or not. The article suggests a rate of 45% rather than 50, which is what I had to begin with. So now when we run this, the starting position is more likely going to be floor tiles than wall tiles. And this just leads to a more open cave system in general. But of course, this is a random value. So sometimes you're going to get more open caves and sometimes they're going to be more closed in based on how many tiles are seeded at the start. The article goes into how you could deal with if there's lots of little separate spaces. I'm not going to go into that in this video, but please feel free to read the article it's got some really great suggestions and if you would like me to do a video on how they do it in the future just let me know in the comments and I'll get to it what we are going to do though is take this further from just black and white image into something that you might actually use in a game what we're left with after we've run this algorithm is a map of what should be a wall and what should be a floor tile but how do we go about actually turning these into say images of tiles the first thing we're going to need is some images for our tiles and I'm no artist by any stretch of the imagination but I have taken the liberty of creating myself some gorgeous looking tiles and once you've got your tile images you can upload them into the p5 sketch using this little drop down here where you can upload a file if you want to use my images you can just open up the code in the description and come along to this file drop down and then download this code and then the images will be included as part of that download to upload those files i'm going to create a new folder and call it textures and then i'm going to click the little arrow and the upload file option and upload my images now this upload file dialog is not the best indicator of when things are done, but if you just look over on the left here, you should see when your files have been uploaded and you can just close that window. And you can see I've got six different images here. I've just got a basic ground, a ground with bones, a ground with stone, and then I've also got a wall, a wall bottom and a wall void. And you'll see where these come into play a little bit later. So now we've got our files uploaded. We wanna actually include them in our sketch and we do that using the preload function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an object called tile set that holds all of our tile images. And then I'm going to create a tile ID. So I've got a wall that is set to zero here. And I'm going to create one for each of the different tiles that we've got. And then in the preload function, I'm going to be setting on that tile set object under the tile ID, the image that we want. So I'm loading in the image called wall.png. We can do this for all the other types of tile that we've got. So as you can see, I've now got a tile ID for all of the different tiles and they're of course different for each tile. And then I'm loading in those textures and storing them in the tile set under that tile ID. What we can do is we can write a function that's gonna take our pre-existing tile array that has whether it is a solid wall or if it's a floor tile. And we can then use that as a basis for creating a new map that uses our tile IDs to tell us what each individual tile is in terms of these new embellished tiles. So I've created a new tile array called tile map, and this is going to hold all of our tile IDs in the array. And I've also created a function called to tile set, which is going to turn our original solid true or false array into a tile map using our IDs that will let us display the tiles on the screen using our tile set. Again, we're going to be looping through all of the tiles in our grid. For each tile, we're finding out if it's solid or not. And if it's solid, we're gonna be pushing in a wall to our tile map. And if it's not solid, we're gonna be pushing into a ground. Now we are gonna get into those embellished tiles in a minute. We're just gonna start with the wall and ground just to make sure everything's working. After we've iterated on the tiles, we're gonna convert it to the tile set. And then in our draw function, we're gonna update it to use the tile map and draw the actual images on the screen. 
as you can see in the mouse release function after we've iterated the tiles we're converting it into a tile set and then in the draw function we're now looking at the tile map we don't have a getter function for that which you could easily create if you want I'm just going to use the formula here and so we're getting the tile at a given location and then using that tile to figure out what image we want by looking at the tile set and then we're drawing that image onto the screen using the image function and we're drawing it at the location of the cell which we'd already figured out when we were drawing the squares earlier so now if we run this Yet again, it was a very silly error that I probably should have caught. In the setup function, when we're generating the tiles for the first time, we also need to create the tile set array here because when we got down to drawing it the first time coming through, we didn't have anything in our tile set array yet. And so this kind of just gave up. But now we're converting to the tile set in the setup function. So this all runs properly. So when we run this, you can see we're getting images displayed instead of just black and white squares. So now we've got the basic floor and wall working, we can try and spice it up a bit. So if you remember, I had a normal ground tile, but then we've also got one with bones on it and one with stones on it. Why don't we try sprinkling some of them in there? So where we were just pushing in the ground directly before, now what we're doing is we're saying if our random generator gives us a value beneath 2%, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in those random little variations. And then again, inside that, we've got a 50-50 chance whether we choose the stone or the bone variation. And if it hasn't hit the 2% chance, so most of the time, we're still just gonna be pushing the ground tile. So now when we run this, and that error is because I called it ground bones, not ground bone, and so now, when we run this, you can see that occasionally there are bones and stones scattered around on our ground. Now, of course, we're generating the tile set each time we click the mouse. So every time we click this, it's going to be using a new random number to determine whether or not our tile is a bone or a stone. You can use things like Perl and noise and use the coordinates of the tile to figure out whether it's bone or stone. Or more realistically, you can just not turn it into a tile set until you're done with generating the entire cave system. I'm going to leave it the way it is because for me, it doesn't really matter. But if you're creating a game, say, then just keep it as a solid true or false until you finish generating the cave. And then and once you've done that, you can turn it into the tile set. If you're being observant, you'll remember that there were also two other types of walls. So we're gonna get into that right now. The first one we're gonna look at is called the wall bottom. And essentially what it is, is it's gonna give us a bit of perspective in our cave. So what we're gonna do is use a different wall texture if there is a floor tile beneath the wall tile. And to do that, of course, we need to know whether the tile beneath us is solid or not. And so we can do that by calling the isSolid function and passing in the J coordinate plus one. So the tile beneath us. If we're a solid tile and there's a solid tile beneath us, we're just going to push the standard wall tile into our tile map. But otherwise, we're going to push in our wall bottom texture. And you can see when we run this, this gives us a bit of a 3D perspective. And you can see that sort of clearly here on this tile. Whoa, hey, didn't mean to do that. Oh, well. So what I was trying to say is you can see that texture sort of clearly on this tile here. So you can see the top section is the normal wall and then the bottom section here is the modified wall tile, the bottom tile. And this takes us to our last wall variation, which is the wall void. And what that's going to be is if the wall is deep inside a section of wall, then it's going to be a darker tile. So you can see we're getting the number of tiles around the wall tile. And if that number is nine, which means it's in the middle of a block of walls, then we're gonna be pushing in this wall void tile. And then otherwise, if it's solid, we do what we used to do. And then otherwise we do the ground stuff. We're just adding this little section here, which means that if a tile is completely surrounded by walls and is a wall itself, then it's gonna be the void tile. And it helps if you use the right name for the function. So fixing that up, when we run this, you can see that in these deeper sections of the wall, we're getting a darker variation of the tile. Now, obviously my tiles aren't very good. I don't expect many of you to be downloading the code just to get these tiles, but with the right tiles, this effect can look amazing. And if you actually wanna go further into this effect, you can look into a thing called bit masking, which essentially looks at the different combinations of tiles that you can have surrounding a given tile in a three by three area. And then based on that, applying textures specifically. So the way we've done this today is a little bit clunky, but it can get some pretty good results 
in a fairly intuitive way. But if you want to take it that step further, definitely look into bit masking. And if you'd like to see me do a video on it, please let me know in the comments. And there we go. Just by following some simple rules, we've created an entire cave structure and dressed it up and made it look all pretty. If you use this in a game or any sort of project, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. I'm always keen to see what you guys are creating. And I hope you've enjoyed coming along the ride with me seeing what I'm creating. YouTube reckons you'd enjoy this video next. And otherwise there's a playlist here with all my P5JS videos in it. So you can become a code wizard in no time at all. See you next time.